Good evening. Um, can you hear me OK at the back? Yes. Good. You won't be saying that after a bit. Um, what I'm going to be talking about is paranoia, uh, when you mistakenly think that others are deliberately trying to harm you. Um, but of course, there are real world threats. The world can be dangerous. And I guess one of the times that many of us will be worried about threats from other people is when we're flying. And I just want to take you back a few years to a Ryanair flight when there was what was described as an alert psychology lecture on board this flight from Sardinia. And what this alert psychologist spotted was a group of people in high spirits, but they can change completely once the flight was called. Then he watched them, noticed they sat separately, there was no eye contact between them whatsoever. But most disturbingly for this psychologist was the fact that one member of this group was blind, but he seemed to be reading the newspaper. So what the psychologist did was what we're instructed to do is report suspicious activity, report it to the attendant. There was what was described as rising tension on board. Certain families that said they wouldn't fly on this flight. Um, the plane's captain considered the psychologist as credible and sensible. <laughs> As a result of the psychologist's action, five suspected terrorists were taken off the plane at gunpoint. But this was no terrorist cell. These were members of the uh, Caribbean Steel International Orchestra, <laughs> who in fact had been uh, playing on the World Music Festival there. Um, the band leader is in fact the world's only blind tenor pan player. He was leaning over to hear the football results read to him. And they sit separately just to take up window seats. Uh, this group has become known as the Tally Pan. <laughs> <laughs> it seems right now we're a bit jumpy, paranoid, even psychologists from time to time. Um, what I think is important to recognise that every day in our lives we're deciding whether to trust or mistrust other people, whether handing over a credit card, walking down a particular street, uh, sharing a confidence with someone around us. We're constantly evaluating levels of trust. We don't talk about it, but we're doing it. And it's easy to get wrong because it's hard to know what the intentions of those around us are. When we get it wrong, that's becoming paranoid. We're mistakenly thinking others may be doing things against us. And where I'm really focused is when mistrust has become uh, too much. The world view has been skewed to seeing hostility where there isn't any. That's where I uh, clinically work. And I see people who are at the severe end, who sometimes what might be called persecuted delusions uh, is, is one of the terms that's used in our world to describe the severe end. And the sorts of things people say, this is a patient who came to my team for treatment. He said, I constantly worried people are out to harm me emotionally and certain people physically harm me. I worried all the time, constantly. As soon as I got out the door, I didn't really go out. I didn't really do much. I felt like a tortoise in a shell. It had standard psychological and pharmacological treatments for schizophrenia, in fact. Um, dropped out of college, retreated into his room, and was highly suicidal. And this is a pretty typical presentation of, of the severe paranoia in clinical services. And this is the target uh, that we're trying to improve treatments. I want to say a bit about treatment development, how we go about it or how we think about it. There are many different ways of doing this, but it's complicated. It takes time. There are many different stages. In this kind of work, as psychologists, we listen a lot to patients, we develop theoretical models, we test the models, and then we translate what we learn into treatment. There is no single cause of these problems. You're developing multiple different treatment techniques, you then put them together for a full treatment, you test that. After that, you try and test in standard services with, sort of, uh, with, every, with clinicians working in everyday services. And after that, you then have to implement it into services. This can take years and years of work. Where I'm going to talk about today is work that we've gone up now to the penultimate level of testing the full treatment. So how do I think about paranoia? Um, mental health in general, and particularly in schizophrenia, psychosis, paranoia, all those problems. It is a controversial area. People have different views. Depends what professional you're talking about. Maybe depend on the profession within a profession who you talk to. There's lots of different views about what's going on in mental health problems, and particularly in these kind of areas. I'll tell you about how I think about it. 
It's my only graph, but it's beautiful. Um, <laughs> it's a beautiful exponential graph. It's plotting in, in a representative group of, uh, of the UK population, the numbers of people who, number of paranoid thoughts they have on the, on the x-axis there, the number of people, it fits to 99% an exponential curve. There is no them in us when it comes to paranoia. Many of us have a few paranoid thoughts, a few people have many. So the chap whose description I gave before, he'd be at the higher end, but he doesn't stand out necessarily. There's a spectrum of severity of these problems. And that makes sense if it arises from uh, everyday issues of trust and mistrust. Think about it as a fear of heights, for example. Many of us fear heights a little bit. I'm terrified of them. I'm at the severe end. Um, so, I've actually brought a, some prizes today. Um, this is a question from the National Survey, Survey in the UK of I ask questions such as, over the past year, have there been times when you felt that people were against you? Now, we're going to play for high stakes. I want you to guess what percentage of the population endorses that item over the past year. Your chance to win a copy. <laughs> That's literally arrived on my desk today of the second edition of the Overcoming Paranoid and Suspicious Thoughts book. <laughs> this, is, this is valuable. So, uh, anyone care to guess? What percentage of the population, UK population, endorsed this item? 10. 10? 10%. 70. 79. 70. 79? <laughs> 20, 80%? 75. 40? 80. A good range. 90. Okay. So, anyone speaking aloud? We're going to have to honesty this bit. The answer is 18.2%. Who came close? Did anyone say 20%? Somebody said 17. Somebody said 17. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> Who said 17? Somebody here. Somebody behind. You don't want the book now. <laughs> <laughs> who, who said 17? Was it, did you say 17? Oh! I said 20. There were two 20s. Two 20s. <sighs> we're going to need a tie breaker now, aren't we? <laughs> okay, in the past year, the two of you, what percentage of the population endorsed the item that they thought there was a plot against them? And you're obviously very good at it, so we'll go to one decimal point. <laughs> Seven. Seven percent? 2.8. It's 1.8, so I know. Oh, well done. It's fabulous. Okay. Um, the heritability of paranoia, the studies that have been done across the general population, differences in levels of paranoia, probably about half are down to genes, half down to the environment. That's a gross simplification, and forgive me, Liz, because obviously there's an interaction between the two. But importantly, there is a large environmental contribution. We don't know the genes that are identified that are linked with paranoia specifically. The environmental elements are pretty clear. If people are banned to you, that skews your worldview, understandably. If you smoke cannabis, that raises the risk. If you live in poverty, you live in urban areas, if you're isolated, all those things increase feelings of mistrust to others. Lack of social cohesion, that is associated with increases in paranoia. That's all pretty understandable. But when I work one-to-one -one with people, the kind of psychological ideas that I work with, this kind of model we've been working on, fundamentally, if you're paranoid, you have, if you have strong paranoia, you have a strong belief this threat coming towards you. And we think there are a number of factors that maintain this, that stop that dissipating despite people not attacking you. And I'll talk you through these one by one, just to give you an illustration of the ways we kind of think about the maintenance of paranoia. Firstly is worry. Worry traditionally has been studied in anxiety and depression, but actually it's relevant to pretty much most mental health conditions. As one of our patients said, he sits and thinks, then gets paranoid and paranoid and paranoid and paranoid. Because if you start to worry, it brings implausible ideas to mind, keeps them there, and makes them more distressing. Worry is basically keep asking yourself what bad thing can happen. So if I drop this on the floor, what bad thing could happen? <laughs> Sorry? I trip on it. <laughs> what bad thing could happen if I trip? <laughs> I, I break my... No, no. Well, I said I hit your head, but... I so we had broken legs as well. Well, go for you, because you're very good. <laughs> I hit my head. What bad thing can happen if I hit my head? I die. <laughs> 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 you 
that's the power of worry. And that takes you from something innocuous as dropping something in three steps to death. Imagine when it's something more personally relevant and perhaps based on previous bad things that happened to you. So that's the power of worry. Also, low self-esteem is important. As someone said, I've always felt that when I go down hallways, people are looking at me, making fun of me, ridiculing what I'm wearing, my hair, no matter if they are or not. No matter who I talk to, I feel like I'm annoying them. In essence, I guess it feels that like everyone's always out to get me, and that in reality, I'm a nuisance to everyone. If you feel inferior to other people, foolish, unlovable, then you feel different, you feel apart, and therefore you feel potentially more vulnerable. And paranoia flourishes when you feel vulnerable. Um, Basically, you go into this kind of threat mode of fearing danger um, and you're on the lookout for bad stuff and you'll notice bad stuff. Um, it's a bit like, well, if you all concentrate on the soles of your feet now, can everyone can concentrate on the soles of their feet. What, what can you feel on the soles of your feet? Socks. Socks, you can feel your <laughs> socks. A bit of pressure. Shoes. Sorry? Shoes. Your shoes. Else? Heat. Bit of heat. Or tiredness. Bit of tiredness. Or orthotics. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Was anyone aware of their socks or their shoes or orthotics or anything before I asked you to focus on your feet? Hopefully not. <laughs> <laughs> and that's illustration where you put your attention really affects what comes into a consciousness. And if you're looking out for signs that others may be hostile to you or that you're, you're weak and vulnerable, you'll spot them. Where you focus your attention is crucial. But also increasingly we think sleep problems are really important for a whole range of mental health problems, including paranoia. This is one of our patients who said it was really bad. I'd go to bed about 9 p.m. I'd lie in bed for hours, really struggling to get to sleep. The voice is really bad. I would see things that weren't actually there, so I'd get really scared. Then when I did fall asleep, I found it really hard to stay asleep. I kept waking up all the time, having bad nightmares, getting really stressed. So I'd get three to four hours sleep a night. It was really bad. It's a kind of no-brainer that disturbed sleep makes us anxious and depressed and affects us in a whole range of ways. I'm sure everyone in this room knows that. But increasingly, we think this is one of the contributing factors that makes a whole range of problems worse. Um, this is a picture of uh, Randy Gardner, who's a 16-year-old in the US who uh, has set the world record as part of his school science fair of going the number of days going without sleep. So we'll play for another prize now. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of our latest, latest trials, Feeling Safe Mug. <laughs> <laughs> How long did Randy Gardner go without sleeping? 70 hours. 70 hours? 10 days. 10 days. Six days. Eight, eight days. days. Five and a quarter days. Five and a quarter. Oh. <laughs> yes. Six days. Six yeah. What is the answer, by the way? <laughs> You'll know. <laughs> Any other guesses? Fifteen. I'll give reveal the answer. Is he did eleven days. Oh. Did anyone say eleven? Somebody said ten. We had two tens, didn't we? Anyone said ten? You win the mug at <laughs> You can see what Randy Gardner said about doing this task. Um, but it was noticed that what happened uh, is that he got paranoid, he had hallucinations, had uh, working memory problems, a whole range of problems going without sleep for 11 days. But don't try and enter this competition for many reasons, mainly that it doesn't exist anymore. It's been taken out of the Guinness Book of Records. But, you know, poor sleep... Uh, is, I think, and we've got some good new data on this, looking like a contributing factor to a whole range of mental health problems. Thinking style is obviously crucially important because if you've got unfounded belief, it's not being corrected by evidence, there's something preventing you changing your worldview. Here's one of our patients said, I noticed myself jumping to conclusions. A woman was walking around this state under normal circumstances. I would have found this really dodgy, but I asked a neighbour who'd been out gardening. She told me she was looking for her lost cat. I felt a lot better then. This person used their thinking style to get themselves out of a paranoid thought. They noticed their thinking style, they uh, gathered a bit more data uh, and thought of an alternative explanation. Most people, when they have strong beliefs, particularly paranoid beliefs, 
jump to conclusions and don't think of alternative explanations and get locked into their fears. Um, we discuss these sorts of things a lot in, in patients and sometimes we also sort of show uh, videos of examples of people jumping to conclusions. So in some of our work, we normally start off with that image and, and work backwards. <laughs> Funny enough, actually, these videos were made to sell subprime mortgages. <laughs> the one time you should jump to conclusions, uh, they were trying to say you don't have to on the people of basis, people's credit rating. It does mean we can use these for free, so there's one bonus. Um, but also, when people are fearful, they use safe ways of seeking safety in defensive behaviours. Um, so, for example, one of our patients said, I feel as if I'm someone's going to get me at night. I'm completely alone. I barricade myself into a single room, set the alarm, keep my dog with me, but still have trouble sleeping. Every night it's the same thing. I check windows and doors, make sure everything is locked, hear if there are any disturbances or noise. It's a perfectly sensible thing to do if you feel threatened. But if your perception of threat is erroneous, this locks you into your system because you don't get the disconfirmatory evidence. You say, I wasn't attacked because I did all these things. It locks you into your system. If you avoid situations, or some of the patients, you know, they don't go out, or they only go out certain times of day when others aren't around, or if they do go out, they avoid on eye contact, keep to escape routes, all those sorts of things, and say, I just about saved myself. So we've been using this knowledge to try and what we want to do is really greatly increase the recovery rates from these problems because there are treatments that work to an extent, but not enough. There's substantial uh, room for improvement in the treatments for these kind of problems. Um, and in essence, the very simple way we think about it is we want to knock out these maintenance factors, we want to expose this belief about threat, and we want to directly help people that in fact now they're safe. And we build up beliefs about safety, and in that way, the paranoia begins to diminish. It's as simple as that. Not simple in practice, but that's the, what we're targeting. We want to build up people's experience and learning of safety now to counteract the threat beliefs. Um, so this is called the Feeling Safe Programme. Um, and what we want to do is for patients who haven't responded to any of the standard treatments, so at the severe end of problems, we want to actually uh, end up with at least half the patients no longer having a severe persecutory delusion. That's our target. Um, and in just 20 sessions over six months, but it's not just weekly sessions, we're much more active than that. Um, and it's very personalised, includes patient preference. There are multiple causes of paranoia. I've given you some illustrations. We do an assessment quickly with the person, identify the most relevant ones to them, offer them through like a treatment menu of things we think might be suitable and they can choose what to work on and in what order. And we do a lot of ratings, so we always monitor throughout the progress of our intervention because we want to demonstrate to the person that this works and if it isn't, we want to change direction. Um, this is a complex area. Many of our patients have many problems, but we deal with that by very, very explicitly saying <coughs> It is complex, but the way to deal with complexity is to deal with one thing at a time. We change that, make sure we've measured it, changed it, move on to the next thing, one at a time, step by step. It's future focus. We don't care about disproving the ideas about being attacked in the past or not. That doesn't matter. We want to find out, are you safe now? We don't go over old ground. And it's very direct. We want learning in the environment. It's not just, it's, we're not, it's not really talking therapy, it's getting out there, getting out and about therapy. We do a lot with our therapists of going to shopping centres, outside, walking and talking, and, you know, making sure any strategies are implemented in the environment, because we're inseparable from environments. It's no good just talking about things. You have to make real change in everyday situations. And our aims are to make people feel safer, happier, and more active. Um, 
I think of it as interval training, basically. Short bursts of really intense activity, trying to change one maintenance factor at a time, move on, and then learn the safety. So, you know, it is intensive work. We, do, we don't just see people weekly. It's phone calls, emails. Sometimes you might say them two or three times a week. We do whatever in short bursts of activity to get over each hurdle. Um, we've evaluated all the different elements in various trials. What we've come to do now is this, we've shown all the individual elements work. We've now put it together in a full treatment in the initial test finished a while back. After treatment, over half the patients did no longer have a delusion and substantial rises in happiness and, and reductions and things like worry. Um, that really doesn't tell you too much because what you have to do is a full treatment randomised controlled trial. We're currently do th doing that in, in Oxford now. Um, so, you know, we, we've got to prove this kind of work does lead to the substantial improvements that we hope and are aiming for. Um, but of course, you know, it doesn't work for anyone, even if we hit 50%, which would be a dramatic step forward for this client group. Even if we do that, there's still half of the people who still uh, are in need of of a better treatment. And pretty much with all psychological interventions, there's a huge issue of accessibility of these sorts of treatments. Um, we can develop in these centres of excellence, but actually getting them out there into uh, everyday services is a whole another area as well. But it is an exciting time to be doing this kind of work. And I'll just finish by taking back to that chap who was a tortoise in a shell because he actually was the first person to receive the full treatment package. And this is what he said after having treatment. I've been going out gradually, building myself back up, so I've got a lot better. I'm not worried so much. It will still be a little bit at the back of my mind, but I still go out and do the things I need to do. Now it's much better. I'm going out more. I've got work, which is really cool. I'm just enjoying more stuff. I worry less. I feel more free to be who I want to be. So he had no longer had uh, a persecuted illusion, was uh, back in employment, and was also discharged from mental health services. So that's the kind of potential that we want to release in patients who are sort of suffering from these sorts of problems. I'll stop there. <laughs>